stone or calculus. Okay, so when you guys did your GI unit, did you talk anything about cholelithiasis? What would that be? Put the right because chole means gallbladder. Lith means stone, so cholelithiasis means a stone in the gallbladder. Urolithiasis means a stone somewhere in the urinary tract, okay? And it can be anywhere. It can be up in those kidneys. It can be down here in the ureters, and this is when the patient is going to have excru excruciating pain, okay? Because those little stones are not smooth. They are jagged. And as they move through this very tiny tube, they're literally tearing their way down through the ureter. Once they get here in the bladder, they just float around. They don't cause any pain. If they get here in the urethra, then you're gonna have pain again, okay? So the pain, that's why some people will have a lot of pain and then the pain will go away. It's because of where it's at, or maybe it's just all of a sudden stop moving and it's just sitting there. Then you won't feel pain either, okay? So it's presence of calculi in the urinary tract. We don't really know why certain people get them and certain people don't. Um, we do think there is a strong association with dehydration. That the person is just not consuming enough fluids. Most stones contain calcium. Now something to get totally out of your brain. A lot of people think it's because you drink too much milk or you eat too many dairy products. It has nothing to do with that. Okay, that is a myth. It has nothing to do with your calcium intake. But most stones are made up of calcium. There are a few that are made up of other things like struvite, uric acid, cysteine, and they can actually, if a stone is big enough, they can analyze it and figure out, well, what is it made up of? Okay, but these other three types, very rare. You're not gonna see a lot of those, especially the cysteine stones, very few are cysteine. So what causes them to form? Well, they say there's probably four things going on that cause stones to develop. First of all, the urine is saturated with whatever the component is. So if I'm really dehydrated and my urine is just kind of sitting there and it's becoming more saturated with things, um, if it's a calcium stone, that calcium is kind of sitting in that very small amount of liquid and it can create crystals, okay? Then as those crystals are moving down, we're gonna see damage to the lining of the urinary tract, which is going to make this whole process worse. They also think that the inhibitor substances that our bodies produce to prevent certain things from building up in our body are lacking. So who did, did somebody do um, allopurinol for gout for farm in this group? Maybe we didn't do allopurinol. Anyway, some people who have gout, you know what gout is? That's the buildup of uric acid in the joints. Well, people that have gout oftentimes will also get a uric acid kidney stone. And they think that there's something that is missing in the body that decreases that uric acid. Okay, so that's just an example. And then either the urine is too acidic or it's too alkaline. I think that's also part of the issue. So just these four things are happening when that patient is developing a stone. Here's the main problem something called hydrouretor. So, anybody want to guess what, what's hydrouretor mean? Hydro meaning water, ureter. So, if I have a stone that is sitting right in here, okay, and my kidney continues to make urine, and then it gets stuck right there, what's going to happen to that ureter? It's just going to keep ballooning out, right? Because the urine can't get anywhere. Eventually what's going to happen as this ureter gets too full? Where is that liquid going to go, that urine? Back up into the kidney. And that's when we really have problems because now we're going to get kidney damage, okay? So the two really big problems are the hydronephrosis that ureter is getting too large 
and uh, oh, sorry, that hydrourator, and then the hydronephrosis when the kidney starts to get too full of urine. All right, so that's what we're really trying to prevent. Now let's think about another thing here. We say that people who have kidney stones can experience these two things. Okay, what does only mean? Small amount, okay? So some people that have a kidney stone will have decreased urine output, which we call oliguria. What would this mean? None. So when would that happen? What would have to be the situation here to get this? What? The kidneys are completely blocked. Which means what? You got a stone on both sides. Is that common? No, but it could. So if I have a stone here, and I have a stone there, and this is totally occluded, I'm getting hydrourator and hydronephrosis on this side, I'm gonna get no urine, that's anuria. That is not common, but it can happen. Usually it's one side. There's one other situation where I could end up with anuria. Where other, where is the other place that stone could sit to create this? Right here. Okay. So if you have a patient that has stones, that has anuria, you're gonna worry about those two things. Either this is true, that both ureters are blocked, or this is true, the urethra is totally blocked, and urine can't get out, okay? Again, not super common, but it can happen. Usually we see more of this as one side is being blocked, okay? So any questions about, the, about that concept? So who experiences this? About 12% of adults will end up with a kidney stone at some point in their life, and it will be more common in males, okay? So what I want you to do is on your canvas, you have a case study. And so let's talk about this case study together. So everybody bring up your case study. And this is a, a gentleman who is from Atlanta, Georgia. That's where we're at this morning. He is 43. He's being admitted as a direct admission. Now, what I want you to think here, we're in the ER, let's say, okay? Or the floor, wherever we're at. I want you to, I know we're talking about urolithiasis today, so you're gonna kind of under think right away, well, yeah, it's a kidney stone, because that's what we're talking about today. But pretend that we don't know that. This is just a gentleman who comes in, he's 43, he complains of excruciating lower back pain for the past 12 hours, he has had recent nausea, his past history is pretty unremarkable, he's had a tonsillectomy, he had a fractured femur as a teenager. He does have hypertension, treated with lisinopril. Um, he experienced three days of low-grade fever, nausea and vomiting, headache, which he treated with Tylenol and bed, at, and bed rest at home. Initial nausea and vomiting, vomiting subsided. Fever has been gone a little over 30 hours, and you can see what his admission vital signs are. Okay, the patient is allergic to sulfur. Okay, what information does the patient's admission vital signs provide for the nurse? So what do you notice about his vital signs? Temperature is um, high. It's actually not fever though, right? The temperature? Do you agree? What's fever? 100.4, but it's higher, it's a little higher kind of low grade, getting, you know, and he has had fever a couple of days before. What else is high? He's very tachycardic. What about his blood pressure? High, right? How's his O2 sat? Totally normal, right? Okay. What about his respiratory rate? Yeah, a little bit high too, right? What do you think is causing all these vital sign elevations? Pain, probably. Right? What do you think is causing this on and off fever? 
go another step further. Yes, there is prob there is definitely inflammation here, but what would cause, does, the, does fever cause elevated temp, or what else is probably going on here? Infection. As urine sits stagnant, not moving, it's a great <coughs> medium for infection. So many of our patients that come in with kidney stones also have an infectious process going on, okay? Um, so, um, but at this point, you don't know this. You just know his, he's got back pain and he's got these weird vitals. So what would you be asking a patient who comes in to your facility with these symptoms? What are some things that you're going to ask to kind of figure out what the problem is? Okay, what is, where, where is it, right? And describe it. So give me, give me some information. What would lean me more towards renal versus musculoskeletal pain? The, the place, <clears throat> flank pain. Where's the flank area? Kind of right in here, right? It's kind of where your kidneys sit. So if the pain is there, what else would describe kidney stone pain, do you think? Maybe sharp. problems urination, sharp. Do you know what we call the pain that these patients have? We call it renal colic. Renal colic. You know when babies have colic and because they have all that pain in their stomach? Well, this is renal colic, and we call it renal colic because this is severe pain. Most of these people, when they come in, will say their pain is 10 out of 10, okay? 10 out of 10 pain. This is some of the most painful, one of the most painful things you're gonna see when you take, especially if you work in an ER, or if you work on a unit, like a urology unit. They have a ton of pain, all right? What else would describe the pain? What's, how are they gonna, how do you describe it? Is it a, is it a dull? Stabbing. 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 Tearing. They'll say it feels like it's tearing. Well, it is. As it's moving down through that ureter, it's literally tearing the inside of that ure that ureter. Okay? Uh, bust it open. Typically, no. No. What, it, I mean, surprising, you'd think it would. It usually doesn't tear it enough that it, it leaks. I've never seen that happen. But I mean, I suppose it could maybe do that, but not, I've never seen it happen. Okay, um, you would wanna know a little bit about their output, right? Um, you know, what, what, what does your urine look like? What might it look like? What'd you say? Dark. It might be dark because it might have blood in it. What do we call that? Hematuria. Hematuria, okay, a little bit of blood in that, in that urine. Are, has this patient had any history of any renal issues? Because once a patient has a kidney stone, they oftentimes get it again. Okay, it's kind of a, uh, something that returns frequently, especially if they can't figure out what's causing it to happen. Um, so question number three says, what diagnostics do you think we need to do with this patient? Okay, we definitely need a UA. What else do we need? We probably want to do some regular labs, right? So electrolytes, um, BUN, creatinine would give us some idea of renal function. Now, ultrasound is the, is the method of choice if you have a pregnant patient. Who we think has a renal stone okay because they can't have all of the other kind of testing so ultrasound is best for a pregnant patient but a not an MRI I mean could CT scan would be the best <coughs> way to find the renal the stones and where they're at you know how they're lodged now let me ask you a question because we talked about in farm we talked about how CT scan, what do we use? We use a contrast dye. If this patient has a problem with their kidneys anyway, let's say this is a, a diabetic patient who already has some renal damage, is a CT 
going to be good for that patient. So what do we have to do? CT without contrast. Okay, so if you have a patient that has already some renal issues, you need to do the CT without the contrast dye. Or we can use, you remember the drug that we can use to prepare them with that, um, to help with that contrast dye, if we absolutely have to use it. It's the same drug we use for Tylenol overdose. Acetylcysteine, mucal mist, okay? If we had to use contrast dye. All right, so the physician has entered some orders, and we're going to talk about these orders. Um, so um, he wants, he or she wants an IV of normal saline at 125 an hour. So what do you think about that rate? Probably no slower than that, okay? Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to hydrate them and flush. We're trying to move that thing, <laughs> right? So typically what I see is more like the rate of 150, 125 to 150. Now again, we've got to watch. What if our patient has congestive heart failure? Got to be kind of careful with that. But if they don't, we're going to want to try to flush those stones out. So the rate is usually pretty fast, up, up to 150, sometimes 175. Okay, if the patient can handle it. I think, good, good thought, and he does have a history of hypertension, but what, what I think his main blood pressure problem is, is his pain. I think if we get his pain under control, he'll be able to handle that blood pressure, that little bit of blood pressure uh, bump with the fluids. He's only 43, but great thought, because he does have this history of hypertension. I and O, makes sense, right? Strain all urine, what does that mean? So what? How do we do that? Strain it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how do we do it? They urinate either in a hat or in the, um, and from the hat you put it in the, you know, that triangular beaker thing is called, and you strain it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is actually a little hat device that has a straining component in it. So that when that patient urinates, anything that a stone that would fall out would be caught in that mesh. Okay, so it's a special kind of a hat you put in the toilet. Uh, monitor for hematuria, which obviously we're going to watch for bleeding. Clear liquids may advance as tolerated. Why is this patient on clear liquids? He's had some nausea and vomiting. And you know, we don't know what's gonna happen here. What if the CT scan shows this massive stone that they are gonna have to go in and remove it? So we don't want too much on their stomach in case they have to end up going to surgery, which then we would make them NPO, right? Okay. Activity up ad lib. So what's your goal here? Oh, yeah. Okay, actually we want that patient to walk, 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 walk. Because we're flushing, we're walking, we're hoping to move those stones down so that we can get rid of them. Okay, so we make the patients get up and walk in the hall a lot. Um, lisinopril, what is that? ACE inhibitor for his, for his hypertension. Hmm. He wants him on trimethoprim, sulfa, methoxazole, one tab, PO every day. Isn't he allergic to sulfa? Oh. Yeah. Everybody catch that? He has a sulfa allergy. Why do you think he ordered that? I mean, he ordered it in air because the patient does have a sulfa al allergy, but why that drug? Do you remember that drug? It is. It's the drug of choice for renal infections, okay? But not for this patient. And guys, I'm telling you, physicians make mistakes too. And obviously, if, ph if pharmacy doesn't catch this, you will catch it when you check the allergy on the name band, okay? So what would be a better drug for this patient? Can you think of another antibiotic that we talked about for renal? What'd you say? <laughs> I think it would be Cipro. Yes, Ciprofloxacin, the fluoroquinolones. 
Okay. Now, this is another drug that we mentioned in farm. We didn't spend a lot of time with it. Oxybutynin. Anybody remember what oxybutynin is? Ditropan. Does it feel like blocking? It's going to help, but what's it for? <coughs> it's for bladder spasms or ureteral spasms. Okay, so as that stone is moving and that ureter is spasming, oxybutynin is going to help control those spasms. Okay, very good drug for people with renal pain. And then we've got two orders here. We've got an order for morphine, every three to four hours, PRN severe pain, and we have an order for Ketorolac, 15 milligrams every six hours for moderate pain. So what do you notice is the main difference between those two orders? One is PRN, one is scheduled. Okay, so no matter what, we are going to give the Ketorolac every six hours. What do you remember about Ketorolac? It is hard on the kidneys, but guess what? It is so great for renal stuff, renal conditions. It's perfect for this, but it's hard on the kidneys. So what's our rule with Ketorolac? only can take it for three days and we're going to be monitoring for GI bleeding and we're going to be monitoring for renal issues. Yes, because it's hard on the kidneys. So what's the morphine for? We've got Ketorolac. So we call that breakthrough pain. Okay, so if the patient is, you know, gets some relief from the Ketorolac, but when he's waiting for that next six hours, and let's say at the, you know, after four hours, he's starting to have that pain coming back, then we can use the morphine. I'm here to tell you that there is not going to be anything that controls urolithiasis except Ketorolac and a narcotic. You can't tell a patient with a kidney stone to take a little ibuprofen because it's not gonna work, okay? This is excruciating pain. All right, so we've got morphine for breakthrough pain. We have our Ketorolac, they're gonna do, do a CT scan. UA with culture and sensitivity, which you guys mentioned. We're gonna get regular labs, and then there's an order to um, bladder scan every four hours and if the output is less than 200 mils every four hours and if the residual in the bladder is showing up as 500 or more we're going to insert a straight cat okay so have any of you had the opportunity to bladder scan yet in clinical okay and so it is like an ultrasound you just take the little bladder scanner into the room you put a little gel on their abdomen and you find the bladder and you figure out how much is in that bladder Okay, and if it's more than, than the 500, we need to put in a red Robinson, the, that red catheter tube that I'm sure you saw in foundations. We insert that, drain the bladder, and then just keep monitoring. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, so for your exam, these meds are fair game. So oxybutynin, you should know. Morphine for ural or another narcotic you should know for urolithiasis. Ketorolac you should know. Okay, those are very commonly used medications for this condition. What is this, the BMP? Basic metabolic oh, yeah. okay. panel. It's where we get yeah. the electrolytes and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, so we already went through number four. What was the rationale for all of these orders? Um, so the CT, I'm going to tell you the CT shows stones, right? So we, we, um, we're just going to hopefully walk this patient, hydrate this patient, get the stones moving, okay? Um, I do want you to go back to his initial history. Um, there are three things in his history that made him at risk for this disease. Male. You'd think, but no, hypertension doesn't actually increase the risk. 
No. He lives in the South. People in the South are more prone to urolithiasis. Remember how we talked about the South being the stroke belt? Where that's where we see a lot of cardiovascular disease, a lot of strokes. Well, they are also, because of some of their dietary factors, are also more prone for urolithiasis. And then the third one is his age. Young, uh, kind of 30-ish to 50-ish male is kind of our prime time for kidney stones. Okay, so not necessarily older uh, men, but more this middle age. All right, um, it has been two days. The calculi passed, great. We saw it in the strainer. Um, he's going home. What do you think you should include in discharge teaching for this patient? Okay, hydration. Literally, these people have to be told, you need to drink a lot of water, okay? Um, there are also some dietary things if we're able to figure out what the stone is. There are some dietary things you can do, and there's a great um, list in your book of ideas for different kinds of stones. So, but diet really doesn't help a lot. It's really keeping hydrated is what is going to help that patient more than anything. And then a lot of activity. So um, if we do know what the stone is made of, there are some meds that patients can take on a, a routine basis to prevent them. So if we know it was a calcium stone, the thiazide diuretics will work. Um, if it's an oxalate stone, vitamin B6 and the thiazide diuretics will work. Uric acid stones, allopurinol um, will work. And that's the one that de decreases the formation of uric acid in the body when people have gout, okay? And so that drug is great for that particular type of stone. Cysteine stones are so rare that they're, we don't really know a whole lot about what prevents them. Um, so I didn't list a med there for that particular one. Now, sometimes the patient isn't so lucky to pass that stone. Sometimes they're too big, um, where they act, you know, just won't move. And so th there are some other options. And one of the most common procedures is what we call an ESWL, which is a big, big, fancy term, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is what that is. Basically what you're doing with this procedure is the stone is being busted up into very small fragments that can be passed. Um, they use sound waves. So they direct this, this is a machine with this kind of a cone nose and they direct the nose right at where they think the stone is and they send sound waves into the body trying to break up that stone. It actually works quite well. The only thing that the patient really experiences from that is some discomfort and some bruising to that area um, once the procedure is done, they'll notice a bruise. Uh, they even have ESWL machines on vans that go around to some of the more rural areas to treat kidney stone patients, okay? Um, stent placement has become very popular. It's a little more invasive, obviously, where they go in and put a stent in the ureter, trying to open up that ureter a little bit to let that stone go past. They'll put the stent in, wait for the uh, stone to pass, and then go back in and remove the stent. Okay, so that has become very popular. The retrograde, uh, retrograde ure ureteroscopy is a little device that goes up into, through the bladder, up into the ureter, it has a little claw, bat, we call it a basket extractor. It's got this little claw device that goes up, tries to grab that stone and pull it through. Okay, uh, again, much more invasive. Um, we don't use that 
until we absolutely have to. And then sometimes the stones are so large and in such a precarious location that they have to actually go in and do an open surgical removal of that stone. Now that's really invasive, okay? And hopefully we know about those sto stones before they get to this point because that is a really, really tough surgery. Okay, any questions about stones? Yes? What did you say the allopurinol? It, it uh, decreases the formation of uric acid. Okay. So that is for people who have uric acid stones. Okay. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about the prostate gland, okay? So BPH stands for benign prostatic hypertrophy. What does that mean to you? Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Non-cancer tumor related enlargement of the prostate. Okay, so hyper hypertrophy means enlarged, benign means non-cancerous, okay? So it is a male whose uh, prostate gland is enlarged. What happens is the um, prostate gland kind of sits right in this area and it starts to put pressure on the urethra. And so what does the male experience? They have to pee a lot. We call that frequency. What else happens? They have nocturia. What does that mean? Okay, peeing in, at, in the night, right? What else might they have? Especially dribbling, a lot of dribbling because of the fact that they never really empty their bladder. Do you think they might have hematuria? They do. Some of them have blood in their urine. Okay. And all of this is because we're obstructing the flow of urine. The urine is sitting there. It can become infected. It can create irritation. We have this inflammation. We have this bleeding. Okay. So it's all because of this enlarged prostate that is pushing at that opening to the urethra. So we, we just kind of answered this, some of the things that you will see. So you will see um, the frequency, the nocturia, um, dribbling that Banner mentioned. Now the other thing you will find with this particular um, disease. There's two ways to try to diagnose this. Does anybody know? We kind of talked about this in health assessment when we were talking about reproductive. Age is obviously an issue. It's going to be when they get a little older. Okay, so there's two things that we can use. What's the other thing we can use besides the PSA? Um, there, well, there is, there is a lot of research now on um, when testosterone is really out of whack, mm -hmm. it can lead to uh, malignant prostate. I'm not sure exactly what you were thinking. There's another exam that some doctors do. Some are now not doing this anymore. And I think we talked about it. The digital rectal exam okay the digital rectal exam so when men get to be around 40 especially if they have history of prostate cancer in their family for sure by age 50 some of the older physicians are going to do this digital rectal exam and they're going to go in through the rectum because if you're going through the rectum with a couple of fingers and you feel the back wall of the rectum you can feel the prostate gland Okay, so what do you think a benign prostate is going to feel like? Smooth. Smooth, key. That's one of the most important things. It's going to be 
big, it's going to be enlarged, it's 